Thanks for joining us, everyone. Um, and wanted to welcome you all to another special edition of Baseball for All's live Q&A uh, that's specially curated for girls and women in baseball. Um, for those of you who don't know me, um, I am Lena Park, and I head up the media and content and some of the programming aspects of Baseball for All, and I'll be moderating um, this Q&A today. Sorry, just letting some more people in. Um, and we're so incredibly excited to have Rachel Folden join us today. Um, on top of being an incredibly accomplished player herself, um, Rachel comes to us today with years of data science and biomechanic based hitting instruction. Um, and it's this kind of expertise that she has that landed her a job as a hitting coach and lead lab tech with, within the Chicago Cubs organization. Um, and she, like all of you joining us today, actually grew up playing baseball as well. Um, so she has a great perspective on that. Um, and Rachel, just so you know, we've got girls from all over the US with us, um, including, as you can see, quite a few girls from the Chicago area um, that are huge Cubs fans. So we're so honored to have you on uh, with us today. So thanks for joining, Rachel. Thanks for having me. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Sweet. Uh, so do you just want me to start answering these questions in order? Is that how we're, is that how we're doing this? Yeah, so basically the way this will work, um, some of you guys have joined before, some of you haven't, but um, the way this is going to work is anyone who has a question for Rachel today, you can um, see the instru instructions in the chat box um, as to how to ask your question, and I'll be calling on you one at a time to ask your question to Rachel, so you can just focus on answering the questions, um, and uh, you don't have to read the chat box, Rachel, is what I'm saying. So, okay, got yeah. it. Um, and then, yeah, that's, we'll just take it from there. So, uh, with that, we'll start off with our first question, um, from Olivia Pachardo, who's from New York City in high school. Go ahead, Olivia. Um, hi. So, hi. my question is, um, how do you improve your exit view as a hitter? And this is like a two-part question. What's the relationship between your height and weight? and your exit velocity and are there specific drills that you can do or is it just working out in general to help you so this is a good question um so i it, i'll start out with the second part of your question i'm five foot four so i'm not tall at all and um i've never ever been the tallest player on my team i've never been i've always been probably the shortest player on my team and so height and weight are not super important to hitting a ball really, really hard. Mass does help. I'm not going to lie. I think, obviously, if you take a hitter who has a certain strength level and they weigh 100 pounds, and then you have a hitter who weighs 150 pounds with the same exact strength level, the ball might go a little bit further if you weigh 150 pounds. I'm not telling you guys all to gain weight. That's not what I'm saying. But uh, mass helps a little bit. Height helps a little bit, but for the most part, it's about finding your body's most efficient way to move. So understanding what you do really well. So for me, I'm, I'm freakishly strong, okay? I'm not as buff as the other Rachel. She's way buffer than I am, but I'm pretty dang strong. And uh, so I could always hit the ball a long way, but I also had a trade-off where I wasn't super fast. So, um, you know, it's just about finding what's best for you and then increasing your exit velocity always 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 start with intent the best way to hit the ball hard is to practice hitting the ball really really hard i think sometimes when we practice we we try to break everything down um make sure your swing works when it's going really really fast too and practice swinging really really fast probably the best way you could do it okay thank you so much welcome um and I just want to welcome everybody else who just joined, um, including Justine Siegel, who's on the call with us now as well. Hi, Justine. Hi, Rachel. Hey. Thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. Sure. Um, cool. Great question, Olivia. Thanks for asking that. Um, we're going to, our next question is going to come from Hannah. And you guys, as you um, ask her question, just kind of introduce yourself and let us know how old you are and where you're from as well. So Rachel can um, answer the question a little bit better for you. Cool. So Hannah, take it away. Hi, I'm Hannah and I'm 12 years old and I'm wondering what are some exercises you can do alone to help with hitting besides hitting a tee? Are you bored hitting off of a tee, Hannah? Have yeah. You, have you, yeah, you're bored. Okay. I, I get bored. Honestly, I don't really hit off of a tee a lot um, with the students that I train. 
we, the, every year I go, the less we use a teeth. So um, some of the best ways that you could do it by yourself, if you have, it, honestly, I think the best drill you could do by yourself, especially during quarantine life, is self-toss. So toss the ball up, hit it. The best thing you can do, and you can do that from a variety of any position. So if you have certain drills that you like to do, you can self-toss yourself into those drills, right? If you start maybe with your feet together, you can toss and then get into your stride. If you like to start with, you're already at post stride, you can toss the ball up and do it. You can do any drill with self-toss. So that's probably the best way you can do it. And my favorite, favorite drill, just because it's fun, is to take like an old beat up bat that you don't use anymore and go out into an open space and throw it as far as you can like a hitter. So just take your bat, really wind up and just try to throw it as far as you can. And I think, you know, you can, you can monitor your distance too. If you start from the same spot every time, you can see if you throw it further and further and then you know you're getting stronger and stronger. Thank you. Welcome. Awesome. Um, our next question is gonna come from Savannah, who's 16. Savannah? Hi. Um, my question was if you have any sort of more specific stretches or workout routines, like the hitting stuff is great, but also like asides from push ups or anything, maybe more specific to hitting workouts? So uh, one of the, the biggest things that we work on is uh, force production. So that sounds super fancy, but basically your ability to take energy from the ground and use it as quickly as possible. That's basically what hitting is. And so any drill, I, I really love, like, I love box jumps. I love anything explosive from the ground. And I also like, um, like where you jump off of a box and you catch yourself at the bottom of the, of the box jump. So you learn how to accept the force too. So anything that you can do to make yourself be very quick from off of the ground will translate to hitting. And also uh, anti-rotation exercises are great too. So I'll kind of explain this in two parts. Rotation, so picture me with a medicine ball in my hand, okay? If I take the medicine ball and I throw it, that's a rotation exercise. But if I'm standing here and someone throws a medicine ball at me, anti-rotation is not letting that medicine ball move me, okay? Anti-rotation drills are great for hitters because they help you build stability in your core and your midsection. So that way when you hit, you can stop your middle and transfer energy throughout, out through the bat. So if you look up, if you go on YouTube and look up anti-rotation drills, there's, you're going to find a ton of them. They're really, really good for that. And, and anything where you're jumping and being explosive from the ground. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Good question, Savannah. Really uh, good question. Yeah. Uh, our next question is going to come from Ella, who is from Hawaii. Ooh. Ella? I'm Ella. I'm 13. I'm from Hawaii. Um, my question was, what do you... What are some of your best drills for being more explosive? I'm pretty explosive, but I want to be a little more explosive in my swing. So generally, if you're already pretty explosive and you just want to see more gains, I would just get really strong. So if you have access to weights, and how old, you, how old did you say you were, Ella? I'm 13. 13. You could, you could lift some weights right now. It's, it's not going to hurt you, right? Obviously under good supervision. So you could, you could start putting some weight on your explosive movements, assuming that you already move pretty well, okay? Obviously you wanna do everything where you're not getting injured and that's where trainers come in. And obviously, you know, this is our first time meeting each other, so I don't wanna give you bad advice, but getting stronger never made a baseball or softball player worse. Getting stronger always, always makes you better. So start to add some weight, start to get, stronger in terms of just your, your overall stability? Great question though. Thanks, Ella. Um, all right, our next one is gonna be coming from um, Josephine from the Bronx in New York, New York City. Uh, Joe, go ahead. Hi, um, I had two questions. Should I just um, say the first one that I had? Yeah, stick with, stick with one for now. Okay. Um, what do you think was the best advice that you were ever given um, in your um, like career path 
and what pushed you to be where you are today? Those are good questions. Uh, my, I think the best piece of advice I ever got was that I, I just, I used to be the, uh, the player that was like a hothead a little bit. So like when I would strike out, I'd come in and like throw my helmet around or I'd throw my glove down and all that stuff. And the best piece of advice I ever got from my coach and she's, I'm short, but she was even shorter is she told me, she goes, when are you going to realize that you're just not that good? And I was like, what are you talking about? And she basically said, you're going to, you're going to fail. Failure is literally part of the game. So stop thinking that you're so good that you're never going to fail. And once I heard that it's true, right? So think about, how we play the game, the game literally cannot end until enough people fail, right? What's the, mm-hmm. the definition of a baseball game is nine innings and an inning is six outs. So until people fail, we can't end the game. So mm-hmm. it's just part of the game, right? So that was one of the best piece of advice I ever heard. And uh, what pushed me to get here, I, I just, I love it. You know, like I, I, I made baseball and softball are priority because I just wanted to keep doing it. You know, I didn't want my career to end. So, you know, that, that was what drove me to do it is I just, I just love, I love being around the game. I love talking baseball. I love coaching baseball. I love playing baseball and you can substitute softball for all three of those things as well. So I just love it and I didn't want to stop. So I figured I should probably put some time into being pretty good at it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, our, the next question is going to come from Arden, um, who is from the LA area. Um, he's got a great question. Um, Arden? Um, yeah. Hi. Uh, I asked, what's the biggest challenge as a girl growing up playing baseball for you? What part of LA are you from, Arden? Uh, I live in Santa Monica, but I was actually born in Chicago, so I'm a big oh, fan of the Cubs. Nice. Cool. I grew up in Azusa. So I grew up in LA and that's why I was curious. I grew up a Dodger fan. I'm a Cubs fan now. They pay me, so I'm a Cubs fan. Um, But uh, yeah, my biggest challenge as a girl, my biggest challenge wasn't necessarily always being the only girl on the team. I got annoyed with all that though. Like I really, you guys probably all get annoyed too when you go to the baseball field and everyone's like, oh, they have a girl on their team. And you're like, dude, I'm so sick of hearing that. I just want to be a baseball player, right? I used to get sick and tired of hearing that. That was the biggest challenge for me though, that I didn't really like take that as something that was super negative. Um, But my biggest challenge I think came from like the adults around me, which is like, when are you gonna switch to softball? Or you're eventually gonna need to switch to softball. And I didn't believe it. And so I just stopped playing baseball altogether. When I was, I, I stopped playing baseball when I was 13, basketball was by far my best sport at that point. And I just, was like, well, I'm not going to devote my time to baseball because everyone's telling me I have to switch. And so there was no path for me to play baseball past this. This is why I'm so excited to be here because I think what Baseball for All is trying to do is provide a path for women to play baseball as long as they want to play baseball. And so that was my biggest challenge is everyone just told me I had to switch. You know, the players didn't care, you know, but it was, it was just everyone kept telling me I had to switch. And I didn't want to believe it. And I, I feel like I, I'm so jealous of the era that you're growing up in right now because I could have played baseball for so much longer. So, yeah. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks for that response, Rachel. That was really great. Um, I mean, so many of these girls get that, have that exact same response and experience. And I think, you know, It came from everybody, even my dad, you know, and I think, and my dad just didn't know any better. You know, it's not like you go and you see a bunch of girls playing high school baseball, you know, not at least when I was growing up and now you do. And it's so cool. I remember there's a girl that I ended up playing pro softball with, and I know I'm kind of going off on a tangent here. Her name's Amanda Kamakona. She played high school baseball though. And I, we, like, I knew her and she played against me and I was like, dude, this is so cool. She ended up switching to softball after her sophomore year. But I remember thinking she was the coolest girl ever because she played baseball for two years in high school. Yeah, and we have, you know, what's, what's really cool is so many of these girls do play high school baseball and some of them are in junior high and are going to be, you know, at that level soon. So it's cool to see that a lot of these girls are, um, you know, fighting for their dream to play. So it's cool. Yep. Um, all right, we got another question here from Elsa. Elsa, go ahead. 
And if you're talking right now, Elsa, I think you're on mute. I, I unmute myself. Um, <laughs> I live in La Mesa. I'm 11 years old. And um, my question is, um, I don't really have anywhere I can play at the moment. So like, what's one of the biggest drills I could do to just keep me, um, to keep me ready to play when the season turns back on? It's a good question. So the hardest part about getting game ready is seeing a ball coming at you, right? Like that's the hardest part. So anything that you can do to get the ball moving at this point. So I would say if you want to stay get ready, if you want to get ready for hitting off of a moving ball, take the ball off the tee. So go back to what we were talking about, self-toss, or you could uh, take a tennis ball. If you have tennis balls, bounce the ball and kind of get in position and hit it as far as you can. You can do all kinds of things um, with getting the ball moving. And then if there's, you know, if there's no one around, you can just toss it to yourself. If there are people around and, you know, you've got mom or dad throwing balls at you and it doesn't seem fast enough, scoot up. Get yourself closer and get yourself a little bit more game ready. Good question, though. It's hard right now. We're all struggling right now. I know the major leaguers are struggling right now, too, because they don't really have anybody to throw to them either. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Elsa. Um, all right. I, the next one's going to come um, more of a mental question from Olivia Keen from Oregon. Olivia? Yeah, I'm Olivia uh, 16 from Oregon. And my question was, what do you tell your players to think about at bat? Like what mindset should we have right when we step in the box? This is a great question. I'm happy you asked this one. When you're in the batter's box, the only thing you should be thinking about is competing with the pitcher, is winning the at bat. So you're not supposed to think about mechanics. You're not supposed to think about, you know, if, what are my hands doing? What's my foot doing? It's literally about beating the pitcher at that specific moment. So I like to only think about the ball. Where's the ball coming from, right? What arm slot is the pitcher throwing from? How hard is it going to get there? And what pitches do they like to throw? But it's basically just about you versus the pitcher. If you get in the batter's box and you let other things creep in, then you can't focus on what pitch is coming in. So I like to keep it about like, you know, some people have to get angry in the box. I was never one of those players, but you know, there's a, there's a coach on our Cubs coaching staff loves to tell me, we, I love to hear him talk and tell stories about how he had to get in the box and get angry. Like the pitcher was trying to take food off of his table, right? Because the pitcher's trying to win. And if he doesn't do well, he doesn't make money. Right. And he's, he's like, so it was literally, I was trying to survive to keep food on my plate. Like he goes, that's what I had to tell myself. And me, I was just like, I would go into the box and be like, man, it's going to be really fun when I hit a home run off of you right now. Right. And you can, you can think different things. And so, but it's just about competing in that moment. You can't let doubt creep in. Oh, I need to get a hit. My team needs me, all this stuff. It has to just be you versus the pitcher. Thank you. That's good. Great question, Olivia. All right. Our next question is going to come from Ashlyn, who's up in Canada. Wow. Ashlyn, go ahead. Um, yeah. Like, have you ever, like, somebody tell you, like, you can't, like, play baseball or any, like, like somebody not believe in you? Yes, absolutely. So I, I don't know if you were here at the beginning, but I told everybody I'm, I'm little, okay, and I'm a catcher. So I was a catcher. That was my position. And I wanted to go to UCLA so bad when I was a kid. I grew up in LA. I wanted to go to UCLA. I would have given my firstborn child if UCLA would said I could go there. And I never got recruited by them. And I, there was there's so like, okay, well, I want to go to other schools that are at that level. And I just got passed over and I come to find out why. Well, she's too little. She's too little. She can't do this. She can't do that. And um, I remember the very first year I started playing softball. Well, I was about 13 years old. I was just about ready to go into high school. My basketball coach asked me to be on a softball team. And he took myself and his daughter, who, had a, who was like one of my best friends at the time, to a, to a tryout for a travel team. And I didn't make the team. And they told me, that, which it ends up being funny now, but they told me that I was too small for the position. I had a good arm, but I was slow and I didn't hit very well. And so I ended up being someone who could get rid of the ball really quickly and could hit really well. But at the time, I probably wasn't really ready. So yeah, I've had people tell me that I'm not good enough. Also, 
try being the uh, the first female to coach for a baseball organization. And and when you read the comments on uh, um, this, is my I don't read the comments, but my family members will tell me about it. And there's a lot of people that think I'm not qualified for my job right now because I never played major league baseball. And uh, so, yeah, I have people that don't believe in me right now, but you know what? I don't care. I'm going to prove them wrong. I'll be fine. <laughs> okay. Thank you. It's a great question. Thanks, Ashlyn. Um, all right. Our, uh, the next one's going to come from Kate, uh, who is 13 and also from the LA area. Uh, Kate, go ahead. Uh, hello. I just wanted to say I'm a ginormous Dodger fan too. Um, Happy Jackie Robinson Day. <laughs> Jackie Robinson. Everybody should celebrate Jackie Robinson Day. But anyway, sorry. Go ahead. Um, so I have a problem with uh, my hands rolling over when I uh, like in my swing. So do you have any drills to like keep my hand like keep my hands through the ball? Yeah. So the hands rolling over. Everybody's hands roll over. You have to figure out when they're rolling over. So most of the time, our well, not most of the time, our hands roll over when that front arm gets straight. So if the front arm gets straight, there's nowhere else for our wrist to go. So it's naturally going to roll over. Okay. So if you're rolling over then that front arm's getting straight too early. Now, that's okay, so don't let your front arm get straight. That's easier said than done. The best way to keep your hands from rolling over is to really work on starting your swing from your hips first, okay? So if your hips turn first, your hands will get more out here, like they'll turn with you, and then you'll be able to extend through the ball. Instead of your arms starting the swing, we get straight too early, and then we roll over. Does that make sense? Yeah. So if you start from the lower half and you really think about turning, I always say like turn your belly button really fast, your hand will have to catch up to your body and you'll turn and everything will happen out in front of you instead of getting long back here and then rolling your hands over. And then uh, how do you keep your, uh, so I have a problem with like keeping my weight too far back. So uh, what advice would you give to keep like your weight balanced in your swing? So two things. First, uh, do a lot of your drills from a 50-50 position. So when you do your drill work at home, when you're hitting off a tee or hitting off of like front toss flips or something, is start like you've already taken your stride and start from a 50-50 position. But make yourself do that. Like don't get to a 50-50 position and then rock back and then swing again, right? Get to 50-50, pitch the ball and hit from there. Or another way you could do it is if you hang back too much, Tie, tie it like a band or a rope around your waist and have someone stand behind you. So they're pulling you back even more and that makes you want to get forward. So anytime you have a flaw in a swing, you wanna to try to make that flaw bigger and it forces your body to work out of that flaw a little bit better. So if you hang back too much, make yourself get pulled back even further and your body will end up working really hard to get to the front side. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Cool. Cool, great advice. Um, all right, our next one is going to come from Nadia, who's from Alaska. Nadia. Hi, I'm Nadia Trainer from Fairbanks, Alaska. What do you look for in your ideal swing? Oh, man. Um, I, I want every swing to look like Ken Griffey Jr.'s swing. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> that's, what I, that's how I wanted to swing when I was a kid, and my swing looks nothing like his, but I wanted to. That was what I wanted to really bad. Um, typically what I look for is, are, are you on time? You know, like I don't need the swing to look a certain way. I just need you to get to your, uh, to a good hitting position on time and get there. You're not going to get there on time every time, but get there a lot. Right. That's really what I look for is, are you on time? If your swing is on time, it might be ugly, but it's probably going to work. If you could have a pretty swing, but if you're not on time, it's not going to work. So I always just start there. Like, can you get and can you hit a variety of different speeds on time? If you can, then that's, that's your ideal swing. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. It's a tough question to answer, but. <laughs> it is. I know, it's loaded. <laughs> um, this next, next question is actually going to come from um, a coach. Um, just says Kay Hardy in here. Um, Go ahead, coach. Hi, I, I coach in a pony league and I coach my son. 
Um, and I'm really trying to get, we, we have a handful of girls at the younger level. And then once you get to seven and eight year olds, um, there's, you know, five or six girls in the entire division. And then the next, next one up, there's no girls. Um, any advice about what I can do besides, I think, me showing up and being a coach is a, a, a piece of it. Um, I'm always trying to recruit my friend's daughters, and I'm really thrilled to see all these wonderful girls here. Um, but any thoughts about how to, you know, we just need to get more kids in the pipeline. I know that's what Baseball for All is all about, but any thoughts from you as someone who has gotten there? That's a, that's a good question. I think uh, what I see, and I, and I hope that this isn't the case, but it is the case right now. I hope eventually this isn't the case. But the more men you have advocating for women playing baseball, the more people tend to pay attention to it. So I would say use your boys. You know, you've, you've got a son that plays baseball. Have him go out and find, you know, gas the girls up and say, hey, you, are you going to come play this year? Are you going to come play? You know, like, like get, get those um, advocates to, to help girls come over and play baseball because that, that is the reality of where we're at right now. And, and it's not going to be that way forever. And hopefully, you know, myself and the other women that are coaching at this level can help to, to move the needle and change that. But yeah, use, use the males, like use the, the, the male advocates to, to get girls to stay on your side. I think that would be a really, really big advantage. Thanks, Coach. Mm -hmm. And I think as well, um, we can, we can talk offline a little bit more about strategies and stuff like that too. So just shoot us an email and we can keep that conversation going. Um, awesome. Uh, so the next one's going to come from uh, Rosie, who is from the Chicago area, and I know a big fan. Um, Rosie? I'm Rosie, I'm 11 years old. Since you played baseball and softball, how do you take the, di the timing differently since the timing is different? Um, this is a good question. I get this question a lot because everyone assumes that uh, because I played softball, I have no idea how to coach baseball players to get on time. And really, if you look at the time that the ball spends in flight, it's almost identical. It's almost exactly the same. So how do you change the difference? You just really have to change your start point, right? So every swing has the load. And then when your foot comes down, we unload the swing, right? Figuring out when to start your load, that's the only thing that really seems to be different, okay? So like in baseball, typically when a pitcher comes, like when their knee goes up, as soon as their knee starts to come down and they start to make their forward move out, that's usually when we start our load at the, at the higher levels. That's usually what you see. It, there's different, everybody's a little bit different, but generally that's a, a decent point. In softball, if you're an early and slow mover, which hopefully you are, so you give yourself enough time to catch up, I like to start some sort of movement by the time when the pitcher gets up to the top of the circle. So if they get to the top of the circle, that's when we should start to begin our load. If you feel late, then start right when the pitcher starts to go up, right? Same thing in baseball. If you feel late when that foot starts to come down, then maybe start when that foot starts to go up with the pitcher but it's about picking a spot on the pitcher for that specific day and figuring out when do I start? I think we all kind of worry about when is my foot going to come down? Your foot will come down. I've never ever seen anyone swing on one leg. Your foot will come down, I promise. So it's about figuring out when to start. Thank thanks. you. Yeah, thanks Rosie. Thanks Rosie. Um, all right, the next one is going to come from Paloma from the DC area, Paloma. Yeah, hi, so uh, I'm 16. I'm playing for, I'm currently playing for my local high school team. And uh, with like quarantine and everything that's going on, uh, my coaches have kind of had to rely on like swing trackers that they've given us. And so I guess my question is like, how do you think that like these types of advances in technology, such as like little trackers you can put on the end of your bat, how they've benefited like, coming from a hitting coach's perspective, how they benefited hitting coaches, how they benefited players, and would do you, how reliable do you think they can be? So as the lead hitting lab tech for, you know, the Cubs, I love technology. So I'm all about it. I think 
give me as, and this is just me as a, as a player, give me as much information as possible and then let me decide on how I want to use it. Now that's me. Some players out there are like, dude, I don't want to know. I don't even want to know what the numbers are. I just want to go in there and I want to hit. And that's fine too. None of those are wrong. None of those are right. But um, I like the swing trackers because um, I, and I use them. I use a blast sensor. That's, that's the company that I use. I use blast all the time. I like blast because it's instant feedback. So as soon as I take a swing, I have data on that swing right away. Right. And if you know what you're doing and like, if you know what the numbers mean, you can then track your progress over time. My biggest advice with any piece of technology that you use is you have to stick with it and you have to understand what you're doing. And if you don't ask questions. So if you see attack angle on every swing and you're like, I don't even know what an attack angle is, ask somebody, right. Or Google it or something. And then, legitimately go home especially right now it's quarantine time after you go and take you know 80 swings go back look at the data and put it on the excel spreadsheet and then you can kind of track your stuff over time and i think it would be really cool to see if you're improving or maybe there's there's something that you're like man i just can't figure this out i don't know how to get it and then you know what questions to ask your hitting coach or what questions to send me an email and ask or you know, to even send Blast an email or Diamond Kinetics or whichever one you use, um, send them an email and say, hey, can you explain this to me so I know what I'm supposed to be doing? Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Paloma. Um, okay, our next question is, and you guys, if you have more questions, feel free to type them in, um, even if you've already asked a question. Um, we'll circle back if we have time as well. Um, the next one, question is gonna come from Rebecca uh, from Georgia. Go ahead, Rebecca. Hi, I'm Rebecca. I'm from Athens, Georgia, and I, like Paloma, I play on my high school team, but I also am on my school's powerlifting team, so I wonder, while you're talking about, like, strength development and stuff, what are specific lifts of the stuff that I'm, I mean, what are specific lifts that you think are especially helpful for hitting and getting stronger for baseball in general? Well, first off, I'm extremely jealous that your high school has a powerlifting team because um, I would have been all totally over that. Things, I guess. It's new. It started like this that. year. That, that's awesome. Like I would have been all over that. Um, I absolutely love deadlifts for force production. And I absolutely love cleans for, for learning how to explode and tilt your, your hips. So both of those things are deadlifts are pretty easy um cleans are obviously very complex but uh even if you can just work on the pull part of the clean and and getting the bar to explode above your hip line i think that is super super helpful in learning how to use your hips as a hitter because your hips not only rotate as a hitter they also tilt as a hitter so if you think of your butt sticking out your butt eventually comes underneath you as a hitter and so that happens while you rotate. So those two movements together can really, really help you understand how to use your, your glutes to power your hips underneath you. And then you can get more power from your legs into your upper body so that you can use it when you swing. But keep lifting, power lifting is gonna be awesome. <laughs> Thanks. Awesome. Um, the next question's gonna come from Sammy, uh, who's got a, a great um, hitting question. Go ahead, Sammy. Where you at, Sammy? Hold on, Sammy. Sammy, I think you're on mute. Hang on one second, sweetie. There you go. Okay. I have a habit of holding my bat low and close to my shoulders like Chris Bryant, so my swing gets very long and slow. What should I do? So I, I mentioned earlier, I wanted to hit like Ken Griffey Jr. But my swing ended up looking nothing like his. And so the reason is because Ken Griffey Jr.'s movements didn't work for me. Chris Bryant's movements might not work for you. Okay. So, so when you, when you swing, you might want to start here, but you might be better off starting somewhere else. I don't know. But I would, what I would suggest is experiment with a bunch of different styles. So one of my favorite drills to do to find a style that works for you, I call it a stature drill. So you stand upright, and I would do that if I had some room in here, but stand upright, like completely straight up and down, put the bat on your shoulder and relax your elbows, okay? Put the ball on the tee, hang out. 
pick up your foot and start to move forward like you're going to go into a swing and then let your body load naturally if that makes sense so instead of starting in a certain spot start relaxed and then when you're on your way forward let your body load naturally and then you can see it and videotape it while you do it and then you can see maybe that's where i need to start or maybe you need to start more relaxed instead of kind of up you know, with the bat sloped behind you like Chris Bryant does. Um, he, might, he might not have the same, you might do things better than Chris Bryant. How cool is that? You might do things better than him and that means you might need to do something different. So it not always, when we look at big leaguers, we don't always want to match styles. You know, you have Chris Bryant, but then you have like Mike Trout, who's amazing. And he starts with this bat way up here, right? So there's just different styles for everybody. It's about finding what style works for you. Yeah, but the one problem is, I've grown so into this position, even though it's bad, that it's like, that will be my natural position. And it might be for a while, but you, how old are you, Sammy? Ten. Ten? You've got time to, to build a new pattern if you want to, I promise. Okay? Just, just going to take some work and some diligence on your part um, to, to, to do something else. And don't just pick something out of the air and be like, you know what? I'm going to start with my hands down here instead. Right? Do kind of find what works for you, but it doesn't always have to be a set position. Um, experiment with other things. That's what hitting is. Your swing's gonna look totally different at 10 years old as it does when you're 20. And you're just, you're gonna have different swing styles throughout your whole career. Thanks, Sammy. Thank you. All right. Um, next question's gonna come from Leah, who's 13. Leah? Struggle with hitting off speed pitches, and I'm a, I was wondering, like, what are some tips on uh, hitting those off speed pitches? Oh, I muted myself. I think. Sorry. Um, good question. Off speed pitches are uh, why pitchers continue to beat us more than we beat them because they control our timing. Right. The best thing I can tell you about hitting off speed pitches is practice hitting off speed pitches. So when we go to, um, I didn't see you, Leah, but do you, you could answer me. Do you have like a hitting coach or do you go to like a hitting instructor or do you have practices that you go to? Yeah, I have a hitting coach. Okay. So when you go to a hitting coach, most of the time, and I did this for a long time too, you just get your one speed of batting practice or one speed of underhand flips, and then you hit really well and you go home. But you didn't get challenged. Your timing didn't get challenged. Challenge your timing in ways that, mimic an off-speed pitch so mix in change-ups when you have your your flips coming in if it's right now it's probably mom dad or brother or sister um, challenge the off-speed pitches but also um, practice hitting in an off-balance position so we can practice waiting on off-speed pitches all we want but we're still going to get beat by them so if you know like what when you I, one of my favorite drills to practice hitting an off-speed pitch is I, i'll put like i'll get through my stride and i'll put my foot down and then I'll overload my front side. So I'll bend my front knee and hold out there and then have someone pitch me the ball and I have to learn how to hit from that position. So I learned this because I'm a big Laker fan, right? So I was a big Kobe Bryant fan. And he used to say that all those difficult shots you saw Kobe Bryant take, he would practice all of those difficult shots. He goes, everyone would look at me like I was an idiot when I was in the gym practicing all these, like, you know, going up, faking, going under the basket and, you know, taking those shots. But when it came time in a game and that had, you know, it presented itself, he was the only person that could make that shot. So it's the same thing. Practice the difficult things. Don't just practice, you know, hitting BP speed fastballs and then going home and feeling good. Challenge yourself in every single practice. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Leah. Um, all right. We've got another hitting question from... Cameron Ely, who I believe is also from the LA area. Uh, Cameron? Uh, so, hi, my name's Cameron. Um, my coaches have asked me to engage my hips while I swing. And I like, I understand the concept, but I can't seem to train my body how to do that. So what's tips for like getting that muscle memory? So uh, engaging, engaging your hips is something that is like a fundamental human movement, okay? So going back to what we said before, if you can learn how to 
perform like a deadlift or a single leg deadlift, that is the best way to teach your hips how to engage when you hit. So for example, if you stand, just stand up, stand on one leg, take the other leg, kind of kick it behind you and go over and touch your toes and then come back up. If you could do like eight of those with each leg, you've now turned your brain on to say like, hey, I'm gonna use these muscles while I hit and then you can go and hit, okay? And so you're, it's called activation. Um, another way to engage your hips is, uh, I call them glute bridges. So you can lay on the floor, lay on your back, and put your, like, your knees up in the air and your feet underneath your knees, lay on your back, and then lift your hips up in the air and back down. And that teaches your hips how to engage. Um, and then you can do that, just do that with, for like 10 reps right before you hit. And then you're teaching your hips to turn on. And the last thing I would tell you is um, throw a medicine ball against a wall. Like take a medicine ball, hold it, and just throw it against a wall. And your hips will figure out how to turn to produce some force because the medicine ball is heavy. And so just those kinds of things just to kind of turn your brain on to say, oh, I have to use these muscles down here instead of all these muscles up here. And that's how you're going to engage your hips a little bit more. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks for asking that, Cameron. Um, we have another question now from, kind of shifting gears a little bit, um, to, uh, from Sarah, who's 11, from upstate New York. Sarah? Okay, so my question is, did you always want to be an MLB coach? And if not, what did you want to be? Um, I've always wanted to be a coach. I, I don't think MLB was ever on the radar, most of, mostly just because I didn't see anybody who looked like me coaching in Major League Baseball, right? I, did any of you? I didn't. Um, did I always, I have always been curious about coaching baseball though, always. So I thought, I, I, I've been running my baseball and softball training business, mostly softball though. I've, I've been coaching mostly softball, but I always thought, you know what, if I ever want to do something different, I'll go apply for a college baseball coaching job because I wanted to just, I, I, like, I, I always thought that would be just a great challenge for me. And so when this, this baseball opportunity pre presented itself, I was like, well, yeah, I have to do it, right? This is kind of something I've always wanted to do. But I always thought it was going to be in college baseball. I never thought it was going to be in pro baseball until, you know, I was kind of just the people that I was around kind of got in with the Cubs. And then I got recommended for an interview. And I was like, yeah, like, let's do this. I would love to coach baseball. I've always wanted to. I've always just wanted to coach. Male, female, it doesn't matter to me. Coaching is coaching. All right. Thank you. That's awesome. Thanks, Sarah. Um, all right, I know we have people who've got a lot of other questions too. Um, Maggie from New Hampshire, I know that you've met Maggie before. Um, Maggie's got a question for you. Go ahead, Maggie. Hi, um, what are your best catcher drills for pop time? For pop time, ooh. All right, uh, number one, the best thing you can do as a catcher is to be a good athlete, okay? so go outside and like run around and play football and play tag and like kick a ball around and just like be a good athlete. Okay. That's number one. But number two, uh, I like to do either barehanded glove drills or uh, with a paddle glove and let the ball get close to you when you receive it. So that way you can always, A, you have better control over the ball, but B, you're not reaching for the ball and costing yourself time. And the third one is, take care of your arm and work really, really hard to strengthen it. Because if you throw gas, your pop time gets lower. <laughs> so train your arm, right? Use, use plyo balls, use Jager bands, take care of your arm, do all the arm care stuff. Cause if you throw gas, your pop time will be really, really low. The lowest pop times in the league in major league baseball are those are guys that have really, really, really good below on their arms. So throw gas and your pop time will come down. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good question. Good question, Maggie. Um, all right, our next question is going to come um, from Tamara Holmes. Uh, go ahead, Tamara. Myself there. Hey, good to see you guys. Um, I had a question. So uh, I started noticing when I coach girls, and I don't know if this is an age thing um, as they get into body awareness or if it comes from softball. But as one was talking about, like the hip rotation and engaging that in a swing, I noticed some that are aggressive and have aggressive bats, but they get more of that hip sway 
where they yeah. are kind of leading this way as opposed to turning. Does that happen a lot more with uh, softball players? Because I know some of them are also playing softball or maybe were predominant. I don't know if you've uh, seen that, as a, if that's prevalent or just you know, something that happens. Uh, it's definitely more common with softball players and baseball players. I think it's a strength issue. Mm. I think uh, like literally how, how much force you produce in your front leg is like directly related to swing speed. Like if you push harder into the ground with your front leg, you will swing harder. Mm -hmm. So when you see that hip sway, it's typically lack of that front leg really kind of forcefully po posting into the ground, which will then stop the rotation of your hips instead mm -hmm. of allowing them to sway. So you, you're gonna turn, like us as a hitter, we're gonna turn until that front leg starts to straighten out and then my right. hips are gonna stop and then everything else, like a slingshot, is going to go right past it. So right. if you don't have a firm front side when you hit, you're going to see that sway. Now, you have to have some strength, obviously, right? If I don't have enough glute strength or hamstring strength on my front leg, it's not going to post very much. So it might be a strength issue um, for the girls that you're seeing that slide through it. And for some, it might be just a mechanical issue. They might have been taught that. They might have been right. taught that with a soft front leg. I know I gave lessons while I was in college, and I swore up and down that I swung with a soft front leg. And so everybody else did. And now when I go back and look at videos, I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I ever taught that. But it's that's okay. funny. So I should look at that front leg because I, all I focus on is like, well, that's weird. Why, you know, they're like very kind of like just like I said, swinging, but I'll look at that front leg too to see. And that goes hand in yep. hand. So think about that front hip, like as it, as you, you know, when you get, I'm going to stand up, we're, we're doing this guys. This is what's <laughs> going to happen. So when the front hip gets to here, I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, you can see me, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. When the front hip gets here, you want to think about that front hip going back right? instead of swaying oh, forward. Yeah. And the only way yeah. I can sway forward is if my front leg doesn't straighten out immediately. Now their front leg might straighten out at some point, it, yeah. but it, it has yeah. to happen like instantly and immediately. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. That was a good question. And I'm so happy to see you on here because I was yeah. so excited to get to meet. I got to meet Tamara at um, winter meetings, and that was like super exciting. So, yeah. Appreciate it. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks for joining us, Tamara. Thanks for that great question. Um, next on the docket, we've got, I think now that we've got the word out about um, you being a catcher, Rachel, um, people want to know more uh, about um, catching tips. Uh, so, we've got one from Alice, who is from DC. Alice, go ahead. Um, what are your best blocking catching drills? Uh, all right. So my favorite blocking drill to do is to take a pitching machine, but instead of putting real balls in it, take light flights and put them in it. You know what a light flight is? Yeah. It's like those like super light foam balls and they, they're the same size as a softball or you can get them the same size as a baseball. And so they they behave the same. They come out of the, the machine super, super hard, but they don't hurt when so you can really get like into a good position. Another thing I like to do too is um, squat about probably eight feet away from a wall and have someone standing behind me and they throw a tennis ball off of the wall and then I have to react to it and block to it. So most of the time when we block, we know where the pitch is going to be and we know like when we're doing drills in practice, they tell us like, okay, we're going to work on blocking. And then they throw it kind of softly. You kind of have to get that fear out of you and you have to make it a little bit random to where you have to react to it. So anything you can do that makes you have to react. I really like that for blocking. Thank you. Good question. Good question, Alice. Uh, all right. Our next question um, is going to come again from Joe in New York. Um, Joe, I know you had a couple of questions. You want to pick one? Um, uh, yeah. uh, I'll pick my last one. Um, so I am 15. Um, I'm from New York and I play on my high school team um, in the Bronx, which has like a history of having some really good baseball players. <clears throat> um, and I'm on, I don't know if I said that, I'm on my high school team, but I was just wondering what you think um, the best exercises um, or drills are to increase and maintain bat speed? Good, good question. Um, so there's 
uh, overload and underload training, which you can do, which is you take a bat that's a little bit heavier than what you normally hit with, take a few swings with that. You take a bat that's lighter than what you swing with and you swing with that because that makes you swing, that makes your body move faster. And then you have to learn how to control your body when it moves faster. Um, so you can do overload and underload training. I recommend those a lot. Um, also hitting those plyo heavy balls, those big squishy balls. Those are really, really good for understanding how to like really gain speed and hit through a path. Right. So I like those a lot. And just getting stronger in the weight room is probably the best drill, especially at 15. Um, you're going to start seeing a, a, like a big difference between male strength and your strength. And you probably already have, right? So don't let that be a factor. Get as strong as you possibly can. Get in the weight room. Go talk to the weight coach and say, hey, listen, I need to get stronger. Can you help me? And put in the work and get bigger and stronger. And that's, that's always been the argument, right? Why we can't play baseball. We're not strong enough. We're not fast enough. So don't let it be an excuse. Go get really strong. You know, maybe Tamara will send you a workout. She's like super jacked. Send you <laughs> yeah. a workout, dude. <laughs> and just to say to that, with strong people assume that you going out and hitting that stuff really uh, good is going to bring bulk and size. It is so hard to look like a bodybuilder. I mean, they, they lift so much. They eat for that size. So don't be afraid. Don't let anybody tell you it's going to make you bulky. That is so hard to do. Um, so yeah, you still need to stretch and everything, but I just want to say that because people, for whatever reason you tell them weights and they think zero to 500 pounds and I'm going to die or I'm going to get huge. And that it's, it's very, very hard. I, that's a really good point too. And I like to bring this up. So when I played pro softball, I was about 40 pounds heavier than I am now. And I lift more and I'm stronger now than when I played pro softball and I'm 40 pounds lighter. So it doesn't make you, you have to eat a lot to get bigger. Like she said, it's really hard to do that. So don't be afraid of that. You might change. You might see some muscles popping through and you'd be like, Hey, dang, I got some muscles going on. Like, that's pretty cool, but you're not going to get bigger. You're just going to get in better shape. So don't be afraid of that. I'm glad you brought that up because that is a big factor when people think about girls and lifting is that we're all going to walk around like this, like Frankenstein. And that's just not how it goes. So <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Great questions, you guys. Um, Rosie, who's 11, she has actually a related question. Um, Rosie, go ahead. So as a catcher, what age do you think um, I should do strength training? I think you can do strength training at any age. It's just a matter of how much weight you put on there. Okay, so like, I'll give you a good example. If I go run up a flight of stairs, right? I'm going to get stronger. If I go, if I, if that becomes easy, then I'm going to go run up a flight of stairs and maybe I'll hold, you know, maybe I'll wear a backpack that's adding weight, right? So you're going to get stronger. There's all kinds of weight training that you can do. That's not necessarily like barbell weights, lifting them up over your head and getting hurt. Okay. So, um, anything that you can do, like, especially right now under quarantine, like I don't even have a barbell right now. I, it's killing me that I don't have a barbell right now, but I use bands a lot to create resistance. So I just went on Amazon and bought a cheap set of like, they call them pull up resistance bands. And then I use Jager bands all the time. And that's my strength training. It all, all strength training is, is resistance training. So you just add resistance to something. So if you want to do a squat and you want to add resistance, you know, put your little brother on your back and do a squat with the, your little brother on your back. That's resistance. It's just adding weight. You don't always have to have like the, the traditional like gym, weights clanging you know iron all over the place you can get creative and and i would say you any any single person watching right now there's all kinds of resistance training that you're already probably doing you can just do it more often thank you mm -hmm. awesome um i think similarly in that same train and that same train of thought um ella from hawaii's got a follow-up question to that as well Go ahead, Ella. Hi, Ben. Um, so you told me that I can do weights, right? Yeah. But I am really small, like four, nine and a half small, and I don't own weights. So do you think that there are any other drills that I can do? Like I do push-ups, I do sit-ups, and I do all the common exercises, but any other drills? 
Uh, yeah, I think if you want to make your lower half stronger and you don't have weights, um, I would say like lunge jumps are really good for building lower body strength. Um, squat jumps are really good for building lower body strength. Um, I just did a workout today. So I, I'm in Arizona, so I can go outside and work out. You're in Hawaii, so you can go outside and work out. Um, and there's a set of stairs right by my apartment. And I just literally like started at the bottom and I would jump and see how many stairs I could skip just to build some strength. And then when I get there, hold that position and let it burn a little bit, then jump up, let it burn a little bit and just see, just build some explosiveness. Um, but yeah, like anything that you can do that creates like an explosive movement from the ground, you will get stronger. Think about it. Jumping is just how much force can I push into the ground, right? So if I can push more force into the ground and get higher and work on my jumping and work on getting faster, you will build strength. Um, run up and down hills, you know, go sprint. I would say, I wouldn't recommend if you're trying to build softball and baseball strength, I wouldn't recommend going and running long distance. I wouldn't, but run as fast as you can and then try to run up a hill as fast as you can and build some strength that way. Okay. Yeah, I do um, the jumps from your knees up. Oh yeah, those are good. What position? Yeah, I do that every day. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right, so we've only got time for a couple more questions. Um, so we'll take our next one to, uh, sorry, we'll take our next one to Kate again. Go ahead, Kate. Uh, hello again. Uh, so I'm a lefty, and most of my doubles have came off like uh, hitting opposite, like oppo. Uh, so what advice would you give to uh, hitting an inside pitch oppo? So I hit the ball wherever you can hit it the hardest. So you don't I know that you've seen some success, Oppo, but you might be able to hit the ball farther if you turn on a pitch and hit it maybe to right center or over the right fielder's head. I'm a lefty too, okay? So I hit left-handed my whole career. And uh, I'm a righty thrower, lefty hitter. So I, my teammates called me a fake lefty, which I think is funny. So I'm a fake lefty. But I don't know about you and your experience, but my experience was nobody wanted to throw me inside. So everyone threw me outside. So I learned to hit the ball that way really, really well. Well, as I got older and got into like my junior, senior year in college, and then eventually when I played pro softball, people started coming inside more. And so did I have success to left center? Yes, absolutely. But when I started turning on pitches is when I really started to see my home run levels go up. So don't be afraid to catch a ball out in front if you know it's coming and work on that and practice hitting those balls out in front and pulling the ball. You don't have to hit everything oppo. Pull the ball. You, you're going to move a lot more runners that way, especially as a lefty. You're going to score a lot more runs for your team, and you're going to get a lot more RBIs if you hit the ball to the right side too. So don't be afraid of the right side of the field. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Cool. I think we have time for like two more questions. Um, so we'll turn it to Hannah again. Hannah, go ahead. Hi again. I just wanted to say I'm in Arizona too, but um, where do you think the best place to stand in the batter's box is? Like really far back towards the catcher, or like up towards the front? Um, so I'm going to give you three reasons why you should always stand in the back of the batter's box. Okay. Close to the plate or off of the plate, that's up to you. That's up to you and what you do well. Okay. But I'm going to give you three reasons why you should stand in the back of the batter's box. Number one, more time to see the pitch, okay? More time always benefits the hitter. Pitchers that throw, like if you look at Major League Baseball right now, the reason why it's so hard to hit off of pitchers right now is because they throw gas, right? So if you can give yourself more time, give yourself more time. Number two, the further back you are, the more time it gives you to, to judge the shape of the pitch. So if you're seeing a curveball, if you're seeing a slider, if you're seeing a changeup, uh, knuckleball, whatever, you're going to have more time to judge what pitch it is. Okay. And then the third reason is it moves the catcher back, which now makes that catcher have two or three more feet to throw. And it kind of gets your running game to be a little bit better too. Okay. And you're going to see a lot more pass balls and wild pitches when the catcher's further back, because now that pitch that maybe that catcher could have caught two inches off of the dirt is now in the dirt. And so again, that helps improve your running game and stuff like that too. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Our last question, I think, of the day, we will go to Karina out in the East Bay. 
in California. Um, go ahead, Karina. Hi, I'm Karina. I'm 15 and I'm from California. Um, and I play for my high school baseball team. I'm mostly a pull hitter. So what are some drills I can do to hit oppo more often? It's a good question. Um, what my mom lives in the East Bay. What high school do you go to? I go to Irvington High School. Nice. My mom lives in Oakland by the zoo. She lives right by the Oakland Zoo. So if you know where that is, she lives right off of golf links, right by the zoo. So anyway, um, the best drill for hitting oppo that I like is so when you're hitting like your front toss flips, instead of hitting with the pitcher straight on. So are you, are you a right-handed hitter, Karina? Yes, I am. Okay. So have the pitcher, instead of throwing where the pitcher would be, have the pitcher be throwing batting practice or flips from where the shortstop would be from that angle okay. and then have them throw it across the outside corner. Okay. So it's, it's, we call it angle toss. So that angle is coming through and you have to learn how to hit it the other way. And so then you just put yourself or another drill that you could do too is have your BP or your flips or whatever. And go, if you're out on a field and you're in California, so you could be able to get outside now, um, put like two cones or two markers out in like right center field and see how many balls you can hit between those two markers. So it gives your brain kind of an external focus on something to focus on. And then your body figures out how to accomplish the task. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. Um, really great questions, you guys, and really amazing insight from you, uh, Rachel. Thank you so much. This was uh, awesome. Yeah. Thanks so much for taking the time. And, you know, we all learned so, so much today, um, both hitting mental and, you know, um, just having the inspiration from somebody who grew up playing baseball as well. So thank you so much. All the thank yous are coming in the chat <laughs> right now. Um, yeah. And everybody, thank you for joining us today for this live Q&A with Rachel Bolden and for your amazing questions. And um, stay tuned for the next one as well. Um, um. Before you, before you let everybody go, I'm going to type in my email address. If you guys have any questions, feel free to send me an email. Is that okay? Is that allowed? Am I allowed to do that, Lena? Um, yeah, I think so. Okay. All right. Go ahead. Uh, thank you again for, for being so generous with your oh. time and for your... Um, your <laughs> Hold for on. Your I sent that to Maggie on her own. Sorry. No, you're good. Uh, um, there you go. But yeah. So reach out, you guys. Um, uh, if you guys have more questions for Rachel, especially about hitting. Um, and again, thank you for your time. I know that this is a weird time for everybody and um, to have you on here has been really special for us. So thank you very much. Thank you everyone for having me. And I'm gonna tune in to the next one you guys have. This was the most well-run Zoom q and I've ever been a part of. Everyone's always too shy to ask questions. So good job, everybody. This was awesome. This was like exactly what a Q&A should be. So great job, great job. <laughs> nice job, everyone. All right, well, on that note, um, thanks, you guys, and we will see you next time.